I think we're ready to um, start our first panel. The moderator is Matteo Carnello. We have um, three excellent panelists, Jennifer Port, Jewel Bergeson, Raphael Legal, and I'm now going to turn it over to Matteo for the first panel. Thank you, Richard, and welcome everybody. I'm happy to see all of you uh, tuning in again for this exciting workshop. And I thank Richard, Maxine, and everybody else involved in organizing this. And of course, our panelists as well that I will introduce uh, in a minute. Uh, before we get started, just wanted to um, get everybody on the same page. We're uh, breaking down now this uh, important challenge of uh, decarbonizing and electrifying uh, industry in um, smaller uh, chunks. And what we're talking about today in this panel in the next uh, hour and a half is about uh, refining and chemicals. So we probably we realized from yesterday's discussion, especially uh, from uh, Arun's perspective that this problem will require uh, uh, multiple uh, efforts in different areas. And it's not going to be one only area that will be able to contribute and solve everything. So today we're exploring how uh, the uh, production of chemicals and the refining industry can contribute to decarbonization and electrification. In particular, we have experts uh, discussing, uh, first of all, introducing the problem and discussing the most important areas where electrification and decarbonization are needed and can be actually utilized. Uh, so the format of this panel is similar to the ones we had yesterday. We'll have, uh, I will introduce uh, three speakers one by one and each speaker will give a short uh, presentation introduction from uh, with their perspective on this challenge. And then we will follow with a panel discussion of about 40 minutes. So I invite uh, the audience to uh, ask questions uh, for the panel and put them in the chat. And then I will collect the questions and go through them at the end of all the presentations. So I will uh, invite first, uh, our first uh, contrib contribution this morning is from Rafael Legal. Uh, Rafael uh, joined uh, Total Energies in 1997 as a, an R&D engineer. Uh, and after a long career in the company, he became the CO2 conversion team manager uh, of Total Energies Global R&D program in 2021. Uh, Rafael is in charge of the R&D team located at Total Energies in Belgium Research Center, working on CO2 conversion processes to decarbonize chemical manufacturing. Uh, thank you so much for being here, Rafael, and please. Um... Thank you very much, uh, Matteo. Um, so I will share my screen. I'm very glad to be here with you uh, for this uh, Stanford workshop and to discuss about the uh, electrification and decarbonization solution for uh, refining and, and chemicals. Um, uh, as uh, a lot of oil and gas company, uh, Total Energy uh, in the last years fixed its uh, own ambitions in terms of CO2 uh, reductions uh, by your first objective in 2030, by a decrease of uh, 40% uh, in CO2 emission com in comparison with uh, the, the emissions in 2015, uh, with the ultimate uh, objective in 2050 uh, to go toward a net zero uh, uh, objective. Uh, if we look at um, uh, the CO2 emission in the company, uh, we can see that uh, this emission are split between uh, uh, two main branches of the company, the exploration production and the refining and chemical branch of, of Total Energy. And you can see here that uh, the, the global amount of, uh, of CO2 uh, emission is around 20 million tons per year, scope one and two uh, for the refining and, and chemical. And if we look at the origin of this, uh, of this emission, we can see that 90% uh, 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 of uh, the origin of the CO2 emission are linked to the use of fuel gas uh, in a refining and chemical complex. Uh, and we have a 10 person or 10 person coming from liquid and solid fuel. And we have some emission as well uh, with flaring and vents. If we look a little bit more in detail, uh, which unit uh, produce this CO2 emission, uh, 
uh, we can see that uh, uh, NAFTA cracker, uh, which allows us to, to produce uh, the, uh, the molecules for polymer production, uh, leads to very important uh, emission. We have also a, a fluid catalytic cracking unit, which allows to convert uh, AV uh, feedstock into mainly gasoline and diesel, which emit as well a lot of uh, 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 CO2. Uh, the use of uh, the furnace of a cool distillation uh, unit emit uh, also a lot of uh, CO2, and uh, the, the reformer uh, also uh, 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 produce um, a lot of emission as well. I do not uh, mention in this diagram the, the steam methane reformer, the steam methane reformer units uh, for the production of hydrogen uh, leads to a quite a huge amount of CO2 emission as well. And if we look now uh, at the different uh, levers that we have in order to reduce this, uh, this emission, uh, we have different stages. And uh, in total energy, we consider a step-by-step -step approach to what the, the net zero. And the first uh, option, which is very important on the current asset of a company, uh, is to reduce uh, the CO2 emission uh, by optimizing uh, uh, the current uh, uh, units in, uh, in, in how complex by optimization, for example, uh, uh, the energy efficiency of, of the processes. Another uh, important lever is the use of electrification of processes on main equipments, um, uh, as for example, uh, electrification of uh, furnaces uh, that use uh, uh, fuel gas, and it's, it's a way to, uh, to reduce drastically uh, the, the amount of uh, CO2 emission. Another alternative um, to go toward less uh, CO2 emission is uh, uh, to replace uh, fossil feedstock by alternative feedstock like uh, bio, bio feedstock in, uh, in existing uh, assets, uh, for example, by uh, doing co-processing uh, into uh, classical, I would say, uh, uh, refining uh, processes. Another point, but it's a, a, a higher uh, capex intensive solution is to transform uh, our oil and gas assets into, uh, I would say, uh, um, bio, uh, bio refinery. And it's a, a topic on which we work uh, by transforming a classical refinery into bio refinery to produce, for example, bio, uh, bio diesel. And the last point uh, that will concern, would say, uh, more uh, uh, the, the period after 2030, 2035, is to build new greenfield sites based on uh, new feedstock like uh, uh, CO2 uh, as a raw material, but uh, also bio feedstock and uh, uh, a very uh, high amount of uh, electrified processes in these uh, uh, new complexes. So, um, the reduction of, uh, of CO2 emission in current assets, um, effectively, we have several uh, ways to reduce it. The first one is to, for example, reduce the, the flaring. We know that if we burn methane, uh, it will induce the production of a quite a huge amount of uh, CO2 emissions. Um, it's uh, very important as well to look, to look at uh, uh, the reduction of uh, methane leaks because uh, methane is uh, uh, has an important impact on the climate uh, temperature effect. And the over important part, I would say, is the optimization of uh, energy efficiency in our assets uh, by doing some housekeeping uh, optimization and tuning of the current uh, assets by, for example, uh, optimizing uh, the, the, the furnaces uh, in, in the refinery, which leads to a very high amount of uh, CO2 emission. Another important point is the, the, the better integration of uh, exergy. Uh, and it's very important to look at the quality of, uh, of, uh, uh, of the energy more than the, the quantity of the energy uh, and to look uh, the, the best solution to integrate this, uh, this exergy. Um, another uh, point is um, also to use uh, alternative uh, fuels in order to produce steam on electricity by replacing, for example, uh, uh, natural gas or fuel gas uh, in a gas turbine by uh, using some uh, hydrogen in, in this uh, gas turbine. 
And uh, another point, uh, very important, is also to um, improve uh, the recovery of uh, waste heat uh, uh, by, uh, uh, by doing a valorization of this uh, waste heat. Um, uh, for example, by uh, increasing the level of temperature of this uh, waste heat, but, but also uh, by uh, transforming uh, this uh, waste heat into, uh, into uh, electricity. So first step toward net zero is uh, the optimization of uh, our current assets. Another point very important in our uh, uh, refinery or petrochemical uh, uh, units uh, are the, the uh, transformation of classical uh, furnaces uh, that use a lot of uh, fuel gas and fuel gas uh, is, uh, has a very important impact on, on CO2. And so the idea is to transform, transform this, uh, these furnaces by uh, a, a deep uh, electrification of these furnaces. So effectively electrification is a good lever to reduce CO2 if electricity is green and if uh, this uh, electricity has a low uh, carbon uh, intensity. Um, the idea as well is to uh, uh, rationalize the use of steam uh, for the process needs and try to use electricity for uh, some specific pieces of equipment like uh, rotating uh, equipment like pumps, uh, compressor, uh, use electricity for tracing, uh, and also use electricity to produce steam in, uh, in, uh, in boilers, in electric boilers. Another uh, point very important as well in, in, in the, in the uh, RC complexes is to uh, transform the, the, the main uh, furnaces uh, for processes which need uh, calories or mainly endothermic uh, uh, reaction processes uh, and so for example it's uh, we, we have uh, idea and project on on converting uh, nafta nafta cracking uh, furnaces into uh, uh, electric uh, electrical uh, uh, furnaces but uh, the same thing for steam methane reformer and over processes like uh, reverse water gas lift which uh, an important uh, technology brick for the production of synthetic fuel as well and the, the, another important point is our ability to uh, well modelize uh, a platform in terms of uh, uh, steam and electricity production uh, and uh, in a way to reduce uh, uh, the consumption of natural gas import uh, uh, and the, the use of fuel gas uh, uh, as well. But we have to keep in mind that uh, uh, the use of this uh, uh, higher amount of electricity will uh, impact uh, normally the, the, the OPEX of the site due to the fact that uh, electricity cost is, uh, uh, is higher than uh, natural gas cost. And we have to keep um, also in mind uh, the, the evolution of green electricity price in the, in the future. Um, and so I would say for uh, a short term uh, the focus, I would say uh, uh, it's important to, to uh, deploy uh, this electrification toward the most emitting processes and, and uh, equipments. After, uh, effectively, another important point is the use of alternative feedstock in uh, refining on chemical uh, assets. And here you can see uh, to appear uh, the, the possibility to produce biofuels and, and uh, e-fuels uh, by using uh, biofeedstock for the production of biofuels and electrons and water for the production of, uh, of e-fuels to put in place a circular e economy and to close the, uh, the loop for the, the, carbon, uh, the carbon use uh, by putting in place the uh, CO2 neutral cycle. Um, so effectively, the uh, first point uh, that uh, we try to do is to make co-processing in, in, in refining uh, unique uh, by uh, using uh, biofeedstock uh, to, to have idea how we can use CO2 uh, as a raw material uh, for carbon source uh, to, to, to go toward a synthetic, uh, synthetic fuel. Um, and as I said, uh, biofuels and e-fuel are considered as CO2 neutral. Uh, but the concern is uh, uh, 
the access, the generalized access to this uh, biofeedstock, which is a, a, a key point, but uh, uh, access as well to the, the green electricity. So I would say that uh, co-processing could be a good thing uh, as a, a bio uh, oil feedstock as a first step to use the, the current uh, uh, processes, but not enough uh, if we want to fulfill uh, the, the future sustainable liquid fuel demands. And so CO2 is really a good complementary feedstock to fill the gap. And so now, if uh, I go forward, I move forward to what the, the, the new pathway that could uh, be implemented in new uh, green feed site in the future. Uh, effectively, we have this kind of mapping uh, started, uh, starting with uh, CO2, water, and renewable uh, electricity. And you can see on this slide that uh, we have several uh, technology brick very interested uh, in the production of uh, sustainable liquid fuel. Uh, for, for example, uh, here uh, for sustainable aviation fuel. Uh, both, we have, I would say, two main blocks of processes, uh, thermo conversion um, processes and uh, electro conversion processes uh, using, uh, using CO2 uh, as, as a feedstock. So uh, we have different level of maturity uh, in, the, in this different technology brick. For example, you can see uh, here the, the hydrogenation of CO2 into, into methanol, uh, but uh, effectively over-processing, uh, converting CO2 into C CO or syngas uh, is a good way to obtain platform molecule, uh, very important to go uh, toward uh, sustainable uh, liquid fuels. And I would say uh, on my last slide that um, uh, if we look at a map in, in, in Europe, uh, we can see that uh, decarbonization and electrification become a reality. We have um, quite a lot of uh, projects uh, whose aim is to produce uh, sustainable liquid fuel uh, with different level of, of production of, of, of e-fuel. And what is very important to say is that for the moment, we can say we are still in the agnostic vision of the way to produce this uh, synthetic fuel because uh, we have not a, a unique way uh, to, to produce them. And we can see that we have a lot of uh, reverse water gas leaf plus fissure drop project, but we have as well uh, some projects uh, using uh, uh, CO2 to methanol uh, a pathway uh, in order to produce the, the synthetic, uh, synthetic fuel. So I would say that um, effectively we have uh, a lot of ongoing projects in Europe uh, based on several different pathways. Um, and uh, carbon neutral synthetic fuel are very key for uh, the decarbonizing uh, of the transportation uh, sector uh, because this sector uh, accounts for, uh, I would say, 25% of the world's energy related CO2 emissions. And um, liquid fuel are really uh, a key and critical for the R2 abate sector, such as uh, aviation or, or shipping. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, it was my last uh, last slide. Thank you very much, Raphael, for uh, introducing the, the challenge and certainly providing a few different avenues to explore and we'll uh, certainly explore more in the panel discussion. Uh, so it is now my pleasure to introduce uh, our second uh, speaker, who is an academic speaker, is Professor Jewel Bergerson. Uh, Jewel is uh, an associate professor in the Department of Chemical and Petroleum Engineering and Canada Research Chair in Energy Technology Assessment at the University of Calgary. Uh, she works in developing tools and frameworks for the assessment of prospective technology options and their policy implications from a life cycle perspective. Uh, Jules, thank you so much for accepting our invitations, and uh, we look forward to hearing your thoughts before getting into the panel. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, so I'm going to be talking primarily about refining as well, um, and uh, you know, good to hear that uh, a lot of my messages are not inconsistent with what, what Raphael just presented, and he provided a lot of really great uh, background information. 
I think I take maybe a little bit more of a, a you know the societal perspective and as well as a systems perspective. And so I think I'd start by maybe pushing back on Mateo's uh, statement and the structure of this workshop where we're looking at these individual sectors of the economy, which I think is important and we need customized decarbonization uh, strategies for that. But I also think that the systems perspective is really important to think about these transitions over time. And I think it's particularly important in refining. And so, you know, what I see as multiple pressures on refinery today that, that lead to different types of decision making if you look at them in isolation versus as a whole. And so this, this pressure to decarbonize is, is there in refining, but it's also there across the supply chain. And so thinking about decisions within this sector really does have to take the rest of the supply chain into account because you can end up with some unintended consequences uh, or miss out on opportunities to reduce. Um, there are regional uh, variable and uncertain changes that are, are projected in terms of um, products like demand, which I think is, is really important to take into account, um, as well as some of the feedstock options. And, and again, needing that systems level to look at that. So my research uh, program looks at systems level analysis of decarbonization options. And, and by doing that in refining, we can help to identify some of the opportunities for emission reductions. Um, that might be most cost effective in the near term versus the long term, as well as envisioning what the refinery of the future might look like. And, and the systems perspective, I would argue, allows for sort of opening that up a little bit more and looking a little bit more creatively about what this uh, sector could look like into the, into the future, which is a, a low carbon future. And so to do this type of work, we have a, a tool that we have uh, built, which is called the prelim model. So it's the petroleum refinery life cycle inventory model. So it is at a systems level. It represents sort of typical uh, types of refineries. We can do three basic refinery types. So, you know, that, that is the, the majority of what's deployed today. So hydro skimming, medium conversion, deep conversion, different combinations of those process units can represent, you know, a range of different refineries that are operating today. Um, we look at, it's an Excel-based open source tool, so you can download it from the link below on our, our group's website. Um, we take basic information about the, the, the crudes that go into these refineries, as well as the, um, the fractions of those crudes to be able to actually look at individual process units, uh, energy requirements, uh, intermediate product specifications, and, and final products. We can also sort of um, look at allocating emissions to the different products. And just to, to highlight here, one of the key things um, that we need to take into account is that we've got a whole slate of different products uh, and that demand for those products is changing. Um, as we think about the transition over time, we have to think about all of those. So as you decarbonize and electrify the economy, um, all of these products are not going to change in demand in a linear fashion in, in the same way. And so thinking about how to best use this, this uh, resource is really important uh, to take into account. And so the example I would give is is electrification, um, you know, one of the biggest impacts I would see on refining is that um, electrification of transportation will decrease demand for different transportation fuels in different proportions over different time periods. And so how might these uh, operations react that they're not going to scale down linearly based on that demand change. Um, so, it, so it's an important factor. I would say that we're just about getting ready to release version 1.6 of this model. Um, so if anyone's interested in learning more about it, happy to, to chat about that later. Um, but what we can do with this in representing um, existing refineries is actually start using it to identify opportunities for reductions. So this is a, a greenhouse gas emissions uh, for different types of refinery configurations. So it's not any one particular refinery, but a range of different ways you could, you could see refineries operating around the world. Um, and then it's broken down by, um, and these are greenhouse gas emissions per barrel of crude processed. It's broken down by the type of energy that's being consumed that then contributes to greenhouse gas emissions. So this by itself helps us to just sort of understand where the opportunities to reduce are. You can see that there are um, that, that process heating is, is a big contributor to greenhouse gas emissions for most of these uh, configurations. Um, and so with that, we have opportunities for incremental changes with energy efficiency uh, reductions and, and improvements and, and things like that. So if you don't have cogeneration, you can better use the, the gas that you're using um, by generating both steam and electricity, for example. Um, improving individual units with you know, more advanced technologies, the higher efficiency, um, those kinds of things. And then there are still low hanging fruit in terms of process integration in some refineries. I think one of the systems questions we have with that is how much do you invest in those more incremental sort of uh, immediate type of opportunities versus looking at the long-term decarbonization, deep decarbonization options. 
The electrification of heating, I think, um, is, is definitely possible. I think what we see in most jurisdictions is that current carbon pricing doesn't make it economically competitive. So until either carbon pricing or other incentives would be there, um, we need to think about that. I think the other question associated with it is if you have a, a source of plentiful renewable electricity or, or low carbon electricity, is it best to use it in this type of uh, sector or should you be using it for other purposes and how, do, how might they compete for the use of that? Um, I think there are definitely opportunities to do that, but I think we have to think strategically about how to best use that resource. This is just another way of looking at that same data. Um, this is looking specifically at the US and, and the refining configurations that are actually deployed in the US. And so now we've got the attribution of total emissions in the US from refining broken down by the refinery configuration type. So again, this helps us to understand where the opportunities are in any one jurisdiction. So we can look at multiple jurisdictions. This one is just the example of the US refineries. So we see that the medium conversion and the deep conversion are the two sort of big contributors to overall greenhouse gas emissions and therefore would be the priority uh, for reductions. This is a third way uh, to, to slice and dice these uh, emissions and actually doing it by pro individual process unit for each of these refinery configurations. And with that, we can start looking at things like carbon capture. Um, and so looking at these individual units, the energy that's being consumed and the greenhouse gas emissions, we can start prioritizing the process units and the, the streams of CO2 where CO2 capture would be um, most advantageous. Um, and so we can look at the, um, the units uh, by their relative greenhouse gas emissions. And then we can also look at strategies for, for opportunities to reduce um, looking at specific configurations and, and the refinery type that has been deployed. So I won't spend too much time on that. I'll just say that if we pick the top process units, so process heaters, that's where we have the maximum potential for, for carbon capture. If we're looking at medium and deep conversion uh, refineries, then the steam methane reformer tends to be another big opportunity. And then with the, the deep conversion specifically, we've got more diversity in terms of their, their operations, but the steam boiler and the FCC units might be additional opportunities. And just comparing these potential reductions, so these are avoided uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, here, this is uh, avoided using carbon capture. We pick these top four uh, streams of, of CO2, you can get on the order of a 40% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions from these uh, refineries. So very refinery specific, but definitely getting us down the path of much larger emission reductions. Um, and with something like a deep conversion, you might have more complex strategies for the way in which you could, carbon cap you could capture the carbon. And that might be something that uh, gets you even further along the path using carbon capture technology. I think the other piece, though, is to say um, we can incrementally improve the operations within the in individual refinery, but I think we might then be missing out on this bigger opportunity to re-envision what a refinery could do. So these refineries are, you know, 400 plus refineries around the world, strategically located um, close to demand centers, and, and they're highly sophisticated, complex uh, chemical refinery complexes. Um, and so we have uh, the opportunity to think about some of these emerging technologies um, and how they might be synergistic with existing or new uh, refineries uh, into the future. And so the, the dark blue uh, bars are actually looking at individual process units that we have in existing refineries today. And then everything outside that are opportunities for additional um, technologies that could be deployed that might help us leverage some of the opportunities um, at that individual refinery level. Um, and so this also just does that connection also to things like petrochemicals and the downstream. Thinking about those more synergistically from that systems perspective, we can think about how do we respond to changing demand for products and maybe connect into uh, petrochemical opportunities um, in, in this space. I think as, as Raphael had mentioned as well, this conversion of CO2 into synthetic fuels or a co-processing of bio-based feeds or other types of feeds, those, those are other opportunities that we might be able to look at um, to understand how they might be competitive in this low carbon future as well. And I won't go through all of them, but I do think that there's quite a number of opportunities in terms of um, ways in which we could re-envision existing refineries um, to, to the point that was made about the discussion yesterday in terms of learning curves. 
um, you know, th this uh, large scale demand for hydrogen uh, might help to prove out some of these technologies and, and get some expertise that would help them scale. And similarly, the CO2 conversion pathways might benefit from being integrated within a, a refinery complex like this. And so we are looking at a range of CO2 conversion pathways the reverse water gas shift and the, the Fisher Tropes process might offer some additional uh, flexibility uh, for refineries to actually adapt into the future. And so with that, just the, the key message then being that the systems level does allow us to look more creatively across the entire supply chain and at synergies between existing uh, capacities and, and future demands uh, and, and, and dealing with pressures like decarbonization. Um, so there are some near-term opportunities that could help reduce, but also that longer-term potential. And I'll just leave you, this is a, a, a Sankey diagram that we had in one of our recent papers, and it sort of identifies the, the refineries as being that linchpin in the supply chain. So on the left-hand side, we've got the, the production of crude oil. Um, we've got on the right-hand side, the demand for the products in different jurisdictions around the world. And that middle point is that refinery. And, and to me, that, that just strikes me as being a huge opportunity to help rethink the way that these processes could connect together uh, in a low-carbon future. So with that, I'll just uh, thank our prelim team uh, and, and uh, look forward to the discussion that will follow. Thank you. Thank you, Joel. This was uh, a great overview of the refinery. And I see there's uh, already a few questions uh, trickling into the chat, but uh, we'll definitely address all of them and the specific questions for our speakers uh, in uh, about uh, 20 minutes. Uh, so now it's time to for me to introduce the last speaker for this uh, panel. And uh, the, the next speaker is uh, Jennifer Port who is currently Chief of Process Sustainability for ExxonMobil, supporting ExxonMobil's ambitions to lead in sustainability and the energy transition, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and increase circularity of products. And Jennifer comes to us with over 25 years of experience in technology roles within ExxonMobil technology and engineering company. Uh, thank you as well, Jennifer, for being here, and uh, uh, we look forward to your presentation as well. Thank you, thank you very much. I'm honored to be speaking with you today. And I've been asked to speak broadly around decarbonization opportunities and challenges in the chemical industry as a whole. And so to start, when we talk about the word chemicals, I'll draw your attention to the right side of the diagram. We're really talking about the thousands and thousands of different products that improve our quality of life and meet society's needs. There are obvious examples like fertilizer, packaging for food preservation, pharmaceuticals, the list goes on and on. Even specifically in electrification, think about plastics that lightweight electric vehicles, lubricants for wind turbines, materials for electricity storage, even down to the very coatings on the wires themselves. We can see that chemicals will truly have a critical role to play in our net zero ambitions. Now, while the industry makes thousands of end use products, when we start to look at things like energy use and greenhouse gas emissions, I wanna shift your view to the left side of the diagram. Most of the energy inputs and in greenhouse gas emissions result from the production of what we call the three primary chemical building blocks. And those are what we call high value chemicals, which include olefins and aromatics, ammonia, and methanol. And this is important because the global demand for chemicals um, based on what we just talked about um, and the global demand for these primary chemicals is predicted to grow. And in some cases you can see by this chart grow dramatically. If unabated with production growth will come emissions growth as we can start to see on the chart on the right. Chemical production by its nature is relatively high energy intensity because we have to do some serious rearranging of chemical bonds. And we typically have to separate our products to very, very high purity in order to meet product safety and performance requirements. So think about things like the packaging that is, that's touching your food or the diaper that you're putting on your child. I mean, those are very obvious examples of things that need to be safe and things that need to perform, and that results in a high energy intensity. 
Now, high level, when you look at the production pathways for these primary chemicals, for the example of ammonia and methanol, we typically see the same starting point. You're producing synthesis gas or syngas. In the case of ammonia, in order to make hydrogen for the ammonia step. And then in the case of methanol, to make carbon monoxide and hydrogen for the methanol synthesis step. And, and we've talked even in, in these past two days that, and there's a lot of discussion going on right now about low carbon pathways to hydrogen and synthesis gas. And so in my talk today, I thought I would use the example on the bottom of olefin production to highlight some of the specific opportunities and challenges. The blue box on the bottom represents the olefins production pathway via a process called steam cracking. Typical feedstocks would include what we call NGLs or natural gas liquids. Think, think of things like ethane or propane or butane. It can also include liquid products that um, derive from crude oil that have gone through refineries, things like uh, naphtha cuts or gas oils. Steam cracking itself is an extremely highly endothermic thermal pyrolysis process. Well, we use steam as a co-feed to the pyrolysis step. It helps us improve yields and prevent fouling and, and hence that's where we get the term steam cracking. So this is actually my last slide um, and I wanted to spend some time here. What I've tried to do is to list some of the opportunities and challenges um, and then point to where in the process they're the most impactful and focusing on um, electrification with starting with a key assumption that the grid has already been decarbonized, which is a critical assumption to make. I've chosen to use an olefin plus olefin derivative production example. So we have naphtha that's flowing through the steam cracker that makes ethylene and then ethylene to ethylene oxide, which ethylene oxide has its own um, end uses, but it also participates in the ethylene glycol and polyester value chain. So first starting on the upper left um, with what I call high level considerations, and, and these really span more than just steam cracking. We've talked about some of these already in the workshop. Number one, we have to recognize that the size and scale of industry is immense, both from a capital point of view and an energy consumption point of view. And so just a frame of reference, um, a modern sized steam cracker would make something like um, 1500 kilotons per year of ethylene. And that can consume around one gigawatt of energy per cracker. And one gigawatt is about the size of a, of a world scale power plant just to run that cracker itself. Number two, um, in order to achieve economy of scale, these plants are massive. They are big, they are expensive, it's typically multiple billions of dollars per site. And they run a long time. Um, I often joke with my younger engineers, we have many assets in ExxonMobil that are actually older than I am. Once you sink multiple billions of dollars, you wanna run that asset as long as you can. So when we think about um, research opportunities and developing new technologies, one of the things that becomes really important is we have to have ways to de-risk and prove out new technology, especially if you are going to um, ask a producer to make a multi-billion dollar, 50 plus year investment. Number three, this is a mature commodity global business. And I, I think that opens up a lot of interesting opportunities in areas like business, commercial, policy, when we think about what is the best way to get a huge industry to shift and change to decarbonize? What are the lowest cost market mechanisms that would incentivize producers to lower their emissions. What about things like industry benchmarks for say carbon footprint of products um, so that people have something to compare and who, who, would send those, who would set those benchmarks and how would we monitor those and certify those? And what we're finding in the chemicals area um, is you know, due to the, the nature of our products, the number of our products, this is actually a really interesting and nascent area with I think lots of opportunities for research. 
If we move to the blue box in the middle and kind of get more into the details of the process, number four, um, specifically for steam crackers, thermal pyrolysis, the temperatures are high. We're hitting around 1200 degrees C or over 2000 degrees F in the firebox. And while we do have electrification solutions that, that theoretically can reach those temperatures, um, the other challenge we have is that the heat flux is also high. And so what we're doing in this reactor is we're cracking and blasting these molecules apart in a couple hundred milliseconds at most. And dictated by thermodynamics, it's just a huge endotherm. We can't get around that. So we have, it's really fast. We got to get a lot of heat at a very high temperature, it has to get in super quick, making electrification a real challenge. We already talked about economy of scale. These plants are big. They run 24-7, 365. They do not turn on a dime. So number five, reliability and intermittency of electricity. It's it's important um, as we think about electrification, it's actually a base case issue for steam crackers. I remember when I was training our operators at our new facility that just started up near Corpus Christi and they were disappointed that we had not installed our own cogen power generation system at that particular site and that they would have to rely on the grid. And understand that less than 10% of that cracker energy comes from electricity and they were still tremendously worried. You know, you get a power blip at your house, your kids might complain about losing internet, but when you're firing massive pyrolysis furnaces and running over 100,000 horsepower of large complex turbo machinery, um, a power blip can, can um, take your plant down for hours or even days. An opportunity that's, again, it's broader than just the chemical industry, but how do we model and design, um, I, I liked the previous speaker's words on systems. How do we design the electrical system from generation, infrastructure, storage, the whole system that will have the reliability that's needed to run these big industrial plants? And then finally, if we move over to the green box, um, there are some items that electrification just doesn't solve. So number six is shown here with ethylene oxide production. You're reacting ethylene with oxygen, but reactions aren't perfect. And, and some of the reactions go a little bit too far and we end up producing CO2 in the process itself. So the CO2 is not coming from the combustion for energy consumption, but it's just occurring in the main reaction itself and needs to be purged from the system. And finally, number seven listed here in, in chemical processes and also refining processes, there's often the production of um, byproducts and off gases that need a disposition. They really need a home. They're often um, uh, kind of a hodgepodge of things. They're contaminated with, with, with contaminants. It makes it very difficult to go in and, and recover molecules of interest. And so today they're typically burned. In the case of steam cracking, there's also a significant production of byproduct methane. Um, which we typically recover and then burn in the furnaces. And so I hope what you've gotten today is that the chemical industry is complex. There's thousands of products that are important for modern life. We focused today on, on one of the three primary chemicals, namely olefins production as an example. And when we look at all these factors put together, you can start to understand why we're seeing so many references and projects related to things like hydrogen fuel switching and carbon capture and storage hubs. There's just a lot of concrete and steel that's in the ground already, um, where electrification on a retrofit basis is not straightforward. And fuel switching the hydrogen in combination with CCS um, probably makes more sense in the short term, especially when you consider you can couple that with other CCS opportunities as shown here in number six, where we have production paths that inherently make CO2 independent of combustion. And so again, I thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with you today. And I look forward to the questions that'll come in the panel. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Jennifer. So much packed into one slide, but it definitely opens up the discussion for many questions. 
Uh, so at this point, I will ask uh, our panelists, Raphael, Jules, and Jennifer, thanks again for your remarks to join me. And um, uh, first of all, I want to start off the discussion with uh, a few questions uh, on, on my side for specific panelists, but then that, that can be addressed by other panelists as well. And then I'll open the floor to questions from the audience. I saw already a few questions in the chat. Uh, so maybe Raphael, I'll start uh, with you, uh, but again, Jewel and Jennifer, feel free to then um, add your thoughts as well. Um, one thing that struck me from your presentation is the idea of uh, moving from more tra traditional processes in refining to then uh, potential new processes such as CO2 conversion. Uh, then the question is, uh, when shall we consider, for example, completely new processes rather than, for example, retrofitting current processes? Yeah, yeah, f f thank you uh, for, for the question. Um, effectively, uh, we, we have this, uh, uh, this challenge to uh, identify the, the most promising uh, way to decrease this CO2, uh, CO2 uh, uh, decrease this CO2 emissions, and effectively, um, we um, we we have this uh, this idea in the first step to to try to use the electrification of of processes uh, and of the main equipments to. To, uh, as a first step to, to decrease this, this emission. Uh, it's a less intensive uh, capex way to, 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 uh, to reduce uh, the, the emission. And effectively, after we, we have this idea, but it will be more in the next uh, decades to, uh, uh, to, to um, implement new, new processes, but uh, it will be more uh, capex intensive, uh, effectively. Maybe I'll ask that same question to Jennifer, because you highlighted uh, very well in your presentation, Jennifer, the fact that uh, this uh, uh, building a new plant is uh, very capital intensive. And uh, when is it that, in your opinion, we should start considering retrofitting that plant or uh, starting from scratch with a new process? I think in the chemical industry, because of the um, projected growth. I think that's actually an opportunity to consider new processes um, maybe earlier than other industries. So please don't misunderstand me. I'm not discounting the very important aspect of decarbonizing our existing assets, but let's look, let's look forward and look at new technologies. And, and what I'll tell you is we're actually considering those new process pathways now. One of the issues we do run into is is taking a risk with with the um, with the amount of capital risk that we take when we build these industrial scale complexes. We really need to find ways to de-risk that new technology, prove it out, um, and have a pathway to ensure that the the plant will run safely, reliably, and make the product that we want. Agreed. Can I jump in, Matteo? Yeah, please, Joel. Sorry, so I think, uh, yeah, Raphael was talking about some of the technologies from a greenfield perspective that I was talking about from a, you know, synergistic with existing infrastructure perspective. And I think the answer will be sort of, I think the answer will be regionally specific. I don't think it's going to be technology specific, right? So I think we've seen discussion of, of petroleum refineries shifting to become bio refineries in locations where the bio resource is, is available and, and economic. Um, in other places, I think there's going to be additional challenges. And I think this idea of, of citing new, um, you know, large chemical complexes should be taken into account as well. That'll be a hurdle to build something completely new from scratch. And so I think looking for opportunities to make use of the existing system, as well as all the expertise and the, um, the, the infrastructure that's there, um, we shouldn't discount that. We should be considering that and putting it on the table. For sure. Thank you, Joel. Um, I wanted to stay uh, maybe with Joel and, and ask um, a question about uh, emissions. Um, I really appreciated your, uh, your work on um, uh, understanding emissions from the point of view of their finding. Uh, there's this debate whether to consider that emissions from the use of the products uh, and the chemicals and the, the refining products 
uh, when should we consider those or shall we consider those as part of the emissions from a uh, refining operations and how uh, then should we uh, consider about decreasing those emissions within the refining industry? Yeah, I think, I think we should always consider them. Whether we place the burden of reductions on the refinery, I think is a separate question. Um, I think you want to look for the most cost-effective reductions. Um, and I think there are things you can do at the refining stage that will affect those downstream. I think, I think it's more the, the feedback coming from the downstream towards the refinery. So this idea of you, you have a balance of products you're producing, um, if you have a, you know, large electrification of the transportation fleet and your gasoline demand drops, um, that then translates back to decisions that have to happen in the refinery. So I think you always want to take those into account. And I think there are some choices you'd make at the refinery that might have negative consequences on the downstream side. So you might be producing products that would have higher carbon intensities or, or things like that. Um, but the, the counter side to that is that there, there are opportunities at the refining stage to also affect those downstream. And we know from the transportation lifecycle greenhouse gas emissions that 60 to 80% of the greenhouse gas emissions come from burning the fuels in the vehicles. So you definitely wanna have that front and center as you're making decisions throughout the supply chain. Thank you, Jill. Uh, Raphael and Jennifer, what are your considerations in, in this sense from an industry perspective? I, I like how Jewel mentioned the, the life cycle view. And I, and I think that becomes an important view when we consider when we consider the functional unit. So in the case of a refinery, that's typically uh, a transportation. I need to I need to move from this point to this point. I need to transport. Um, for chemicals, what we find is is the story due to the thousands of products we have, it, it while the life cycle view is critical, it becomes it becomes difficult um, to to just take a single product and then and then presuppose what all the uses will be for that product. So there there are some examples like um, packaging, where the functional unit is to contain something and to preserve it, and and we do see um, you know certain chemicals like uh, like polyethylene packaging having life cycle advantages versus other alternative materials. But then, you know, you have to consider the um, the whole life cycle of that plastic and it becomes a, an interesting and complex conversation. And that's where we point to things like, um, you know, there's lots of, there's LCAs that are published in the literature and you can see a lot of differences in those. And that's why something like an industry benchmark or this is the way we're gonna view this. Um, we need to start moving towards that so we can all get on the same page and move in the same direction to reduce emissions. Thank you, Rafael. You wanna add yes. to the discussion, please? Yeah. Uh, yes, and uh, I completely uh, agree with uh, uh, Jules and uh, uh, Jennifer arguments. Uh, and effectively uh, it's, uh, uh, something that we perform as well, uh, this uh, complete uh, LCA uh, uh, study, but uh, take into account effectively the, the use of, of the fuels. Uh, and uh, yes, uh, for, for our side, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, a need uh, to, uh, to take into consideration this, uh, this fuel uh, consumption. So may I ask Raphael, you know, part in, uh, for your particular company, this goal of net zero, does that take into account then the emissions from the use of the products or is it in the operations? Uh, if effectively um, in, in, in our uh, uh, ambition, we have uh, the defined, but uh, I think it's the same uh, uh, thing for the over uh, oil and gas company uh, that we will uh, uh, split uh, the, the uh, CO2 emission into uh, several scope. Uh, and effectively, uh, we have uh, defined our objective in scope one, two, uh, and three. Uh, and uh, effectively, it's well, uh, it's well uh, uh, taken into account in our ambition. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Raphael, I wanted to go a little bit more into details of uh, especially uh, CO2 conversion, for example, the case scenario that you presented from your company's perspective. And uh, I'm wondering, how do advances in other processes then affect your plans for electrification and decarbonization? So 
So for example, I would imagine that um, planning for making chemicals from CO2 would rely on advances on CO2 capture, for example, or, or maybe not. How do you deal with uh, this potential uncertainty in having to develop other processes as well before you're able to then really tackle the challenges in decarbonizing electrifying and electrifying certain processes in your company? Yep. So uh, if, effectively, uh, the, uh, the, the CO2, uh, CO2 conversion uh, topic uh, is uh, really a, a topic in R&D uh, in, in the company. Uh, and so effectively, we are organized, uh, I would say, uh, in, uh, in a program dealing with uh, the, the complete uh, um, uh, overall chain of, uh, of uh, CO2, so the CCUS uh, value chain. So we take into account uh, uh, effectively the, the challenges in the area of uh, uh, CO2 uh, capture. Uh, and uh, effectively, we have uh, uh, R&D in, uh, in this area. And effectively, in the conversion and in, in the use of CO2, um, we, um, we uh, work on uh, different pr processes, electrified processes to convert CO2 into a, a platform molecule. Uh, allowing to, to produce uh, yes, uh, a synthetic, uh, synthetic fuel. Thank you. Um, Joel, uh, in the context of uh, process heating, I guess your analysis was really uh, uh, interesting in highlighting really the particular processes that are most important to target in, in order to uh, decarbonize um, the, the refining operations. So do you see from your perspective, uh, interesting options for solving the problem of um, uh, heating, uh, give, provided that the pricing scheme for carbon is not going to change? Because of course, that's going, that's a, that would be a major factor. But since heating is one of the most important elements playing a role in energy consumption, do you see, are you aware of uh, or from your perspective, are there options for heating that are that seem to be more appealing than others, especially from an LCA and a, a point of view? Yeah, so we, we haven't spent um, too much time going into individual units and the conversion that would be required to electrify the, the heating process. It's obviously technically possible, but the economics seem to be challenged right now for, for refining. I think the other side, Raphael had, had mentioned as well, is that the refinery fuel gas is something that is produced within the system and is an energy resource to use. Um, and so if you're going to switch to something else, you have to think about how you would use that product as well. Um, and so the carbon capture on that system seems to be a good fit uh, for that heating and, and seems to be more competitive from an economic perspective today than, than electrifying. Um, I think there might be opportunities to think about other ways to use that fuel gas, uh, you know, in terms of pairing it with a petrochemical process or, or something else. Um, but I think you know it's it's not a um, an easy fit in terms of something else that might be on the table. I would say that the most promise I see is with the carbon capture. Thank you, Joel. That then allows me to um, ask a provocative question. Then, um, how about shall we consider then carbon capture as a solution to everything? So rather than kind of like worrying off uh, decarbonizing specific processes, should we put all our chips into carbon capture or is that a wrong way to consider options for the future? Yeah, and I always go back to my systems thinking, right? I think, I think that uh, with, with carbon capture, you know, you're, you're placing it on a, a stream of CO2 but if that stream of CO2 is, is going away because of the demand for the product that that, that process is uh, producing, um, you, you don't want to be you know, investing in something that in the long term is not going to deliver. Right? So I think you need to have the, the sort of short term, medium term, long term horizon perspective in terms of which, which of these investments are going to make sense today and in the near term to get us some early uh, reductions. But then what is also going to be a robust decision into the future that we know is highly uncertain, right? Where the carbon pricing will be at 2050, um, whether or not we've maintained our momentum in, in achieving uh, net zero, you know, all of those kind of questions come in to decide which of these investments is going to make sense. And, and hopefully we're taking that different time period horizon into account when we make those decisions. Jennifer, Rafael, do you want to comment? Yeah, I would hesitate with the phrase, put all our chips into CCS, but we absolutely 
do believe that that CCS is a critical part of this decarbonization solution for a lot of the reasons um, that we've already talked about. When I've started to see the world as kind of a, a soup or a mix of carbon and hydrogen. And um, you know, regarding the CO2 utilization question, when you look at a carbon hydrogen balance, and especially if we look at those chemicals building block products that I mentioned, ammonia, methanol, and olefins, they have a very high um, hydrogen to carbon ratio. I always, the thing I'm missing is hydrogen. I'm rarely missing carbon. So uh, I think CO2 utilization is challenged from a thermodynamic perspective and also from a resource perspective. I got plenty of carbon around. What I don't have is hydrogen. I think, I think CCS coupled with hydrogen production is gonna be a, a game changer um, in the coming years for sure. Rafa. Yeah. Yes, and uh, effectively, as I said, in in uh, total energy company, we uh, we look at uh, all all the chain, uh, all the CCUS uh, chain. So we consider that uh, uh, we can develop uh, a specific uh, business model around the CCS. Uh, carbon capture is very important because it's a way to uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to 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 take the CO2 produced by uh, our uh, unit. Uh, so we have uh, we have to develop the installation, the implementation of a CO2 capture unit uh, in order to to uh, to um, uh, to have this stream of CO2. But we think uh, in in the company as well uh, the importance of uh, a CO2. Uh, conversion, CO2 utilization uh, to go toward a synthetic fuel. So I would say that we have a, an overall view uh, by um, using both, I would say, uh, CCS uh, and CCU uh, perspective to uh, transform our industry. Thank you. I agree on the um, complex perspective and on looking at different options for sure. But um, I also um, uh, like really Jennifer's uh, words on the fact that uh, carbon capture and hydrogen in particular are going to be keys for the future. Um, so I want to now, um, I would have more questions, but I want to make sure we go through the questions asked by the audience before we uh, conclude in this panel. There was actually a question by Loic Franke for Jewel. I want to go in, in order. Um, and Jill, the question was, what are the frontiers of your system? Although I don't really understand the, uh, the overall meaning of the question. So maybe like if you want to, if there's a chance to unmute yourself and maybe ask Jill the question directly. Yes, can you hear me? Yeah, perfect. Like, please go ahead. Yes, my question is, that is uh, in the LCA that was considered by Jill, what is the frontier of the system that was considered? Is it only as a refinery or the complete system from from the well to uh, to grave. Yes, thank you. So, so the boundary of the the emissions that I was presenting are just the refinery gate, but they do include emissions that come from electricity consumption. Um, if you're consuming purchased natural gas, then it has the upstream natural gas consumed. It doesn't have the extraction of the resources or the end use because I was focused on opportunities to reduce emissions within the refinery. That's just one way to look at it though, right? We, we collaborate with Adam Brandt at Stanford who has the OPTU model to look at the upstream and variability and upstream extraction of resources, as well as looking at the downstream pieces. So I was focused today on the refining boundary, but um, definitely you know, need to connect that into the full life cycle to really um, see the full picture. Thank you, Jules. And another question, did you consider a new electricity supply as uh, a low carbon electricity transition in the grid? Uh, that means that today uh, the electricity uh, uh, carbon footprint is what it is, but within the transition, it will be more and more decarbonized. Did you consider in your transition this decarbonization of the electricity grid? Yes, very much so. So I think you know one thing that we showed was that the electricity emissions, even using, say, natural gas for your electricity source, um, are a relatively small contribution to the total uh, greenhouse gas emissions in a refinery. Um, and if as you transition that lower, it will reduce, but it'll be more moderate than something like carbon capture and storage on the, the steam generation units, for example. Um, I think the other side of it is, you know, how best to use renewable or low carbon electricity. Um, I think that's still an open question, but definitely something we take into account when we look at that, that future of refining. 
Thank you, Jill. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jill. We'll get back to you. Uh, there was another question from uh, uh, Matt Cannon to Raphael. Matt, do you want to unmute yourself and ask directly the question? Sure. Yeah. Thanks. And just a little bit more context. So, so thinking about you know alternative routes to to jet fuel, starting from green hydrogen and CO two. Um, so, yes, my understanding is that the CO two hydrogenation of methanol is pretty well established technically, um, and so you know, what is the value of trying to develop the CO2 hydrogenation to ethanol versus what we already have with CO2 to methanol if the end goal is jet? In, in other words, is ethanol a, a more advantageous intermediate on the way to the jet than, than methanol, you know, with, with current alcohol to jet uh, conversion technologies? Yeah, thank you for the question. It's a good, it's a, it's a good one, uh, and I would say that the, the first part of the story is uh, how to to produce effectively uh, alcohol. Alcohol is is a very good uh, platform, a uh, very good platform molecules uh, toward uh, sustainable liquid liquid fuel. So uh, the, the first part is the production of this uh, alcohol. So we have the choice between methanol, as you said. Uh, from hydrogenation of CO2, it's a, it's a mature technology. Um, and after you have the production of ethanol, so you have different possibility to produce uh, ethanol. And what is interesting is to compare the different ways uh, to produce uh, alcohol. So uh, methanol versus uh, ethanol, it's the first point. But when you have produced uh, ethanol, you are not at the end of a story. So after that, you have to add several technology brick in order to reach uh, the, 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 the SAF or the EJET. Um, and so what is important to consider as well is what you will have at the outlet of uh, after the, 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 the alcohol production and the typology of, of olefins that you will produce if it's uh, uh, ethylene or propylene or butene, because in function of the uh, quality of the olefins, the uh, difficulty or ability to produce sustainable aviation fuel will not be the same. So I would say that what is very important is to develop, I would say, uh, a, a, a complete uh, a tool which allow us to benchmark this different pathway, you know, uh, between CO2 until the production of sustainable aviation fuel. And I would say that uh, at the end, we will not have um, perhaps a, a unique solution. This solution will depend of very, uh, of a lot of parameters, the location where you will produce the SAF, uh, the cost of electricity, uh, the, the, the amount of CO2 in the, in the uh, electricity that you will use to produce this SAF. So I would say it's a very complex question and you need to, to develop, uh, I would say, a, a very deep modeling uh, of all these different pathways in order to, uh, to specifically orientate the, the business uh, of, uh, of the company. Thank you. Yeah. I was just going to add to that. I think that that's right. We're looking at this right now. Um, and one of the things that's come up is to say, if you want to go through ethanol to jet, um, then you need to think about the competing pathways. And so there are some commercial scale uh, biomass pathways to ethanol. Uh, and it has been suggested that those will likely always be more competitive than a CO2 conversion to ethanol to jet. Um, I, I'm not ready to stand behind that yet. I think we need to do some additional uh, assessment to understand that. But I think it highlights the point that as you start looking at these pathways, you need to think about you know these some of these early stage technologies and how they might evolve over time and what their potential is, but also what will they be competing against? Um, and under what conditions might you prefer the CO2 conversion to other pathways that we have available um, to, to just adding more questions to this rather than answers, but. Thank you, Jill, for that perspective as well. Uh, and maybe uh, before we move to the next question, uh, Raphael, this question from Matt highlighted uh, the fact that uh, in your chart, in your schematic of the multiple ways to move from CO2 to different products, all the things, uh, you had uh, some of the processes were um, electrified processes. Some of them were thermochemical, and there was one only process, the one that uh, then uh, Matt was uh, asking about, which is biological, uh, probably enzymatic approaches. How do you see then in the 
context of decarbonization and electrification, the role of uh, biological processes, especially in the production of chemicals. Mm -hmm. Yes, this um, this type of uh, of processes is uh, of interest for uh, uh, for uh, to total uh, energy, and so we, this uh, these processes are of interest for for, for us, um, effectively because uh, um, we are able to to start uh, to start uh, the, the the conversion of of CO two or CO. Uh, with this uh, biological uh, technology, uh, and I would say it's very interesting to see in which extent we can uh, uh, use as well over processes in conjunction of these biological uh, processes uh, to um, to have a synergy. Uh, for example, we can uh, effectively imagine uh, reverse water gas heat, which is a thermal uh, conversion process, very interested in the way to produce CO. And we know that CO could be the, a good feedstock for uh, bio, biological processes uh, in order to enrich the, the feedstock. So uh, we see that we can have a synergy between uh, uh, between uh, several uh, several processes. But uh, effectively, uh, these uh, bi biological processes have to be uh, as well compared to over pathway uh, to produce uh, uh, liquid fuel. I see that uh, Shafiq Jaffer commented on this discussion. Shafiq, do you want to unmute yourself and maybe provide us with your opinion on this? Yeah, sure. I, I think, you know, there's no silver bullet here. And I think anybody that's believing that is in a pipe dream. Uh, things like NIMBY issues, not in my backyard issues. Uh, acceptability of the public are going to overplay anything technical by far. The politicians and how uh, policy is going to make are going to be driven first by that, right? If we think it's going to be technical, rational, driving policy, you know, you uh, haven't been paying attention to politics sufficiently. So let's first put that on the table. And the second one then is limitations of renewable electricity, how much you can actually get to where you need it and where the CO2 sources are is going to also limit how much you can do in terms of production of fuels or any kind of chemicals out of CO2. And the second is of biomass as well is not available everywhere in sufficient quantities. So we need to think about where's the highest value for the various sources and biomass probably has the highest value to kind of go for jet fuel short term right, as we try to fit a very constrained problem because uh, of the existing fleets and existing equipment that you can't just substitute uh, fuels easily. You have to have very specific uh, specific specifications on the fuels. Uh, people forget all the aging issues and material compatibility issues in these planes have been designed for very tight tolerances on specifications of fuels. So you can't just substitute anything easily in there. And as we try to broaden that, then, you know, perhaps bio and that can be spread out. But I think we have to take the most value for where the most constraint is when we think about use of the bio sources. So let's not forget about kind of these other constraints when we talk about trying to say, okay, there's one pathway or one silver bullet here. I, I don't think there is by any means. Yeah, thank you, Shafiq. That's a very important uh, element to keep in mind. Jewel, just, please. Yeah, I was just going to respond on that. I think I think that's all very uh, critical as we go through this. I think the techno-economic greenhouse gas footprint is part of the decision-making process. Um, public acceptance, like I think all of these things are pointing towards that regional uh, transition um, and really keeping that focused on both regional in terms of availability of resources, as well as public perception. And, and um, you know, that will be different in different regions as well. I just highlight as well that I think as part of that, um, having a credible and transparent system by which you actually demonstrate to society that you've achieved your reductions is really critical. And we're not seeing um, enough movement in that direction, I think. I think you know we can find the best technical solution and, and really succeed in, in implementing some of these technologies. But if we don't have a robust system that society buys into in terms of a, a, an accounting process by which we can track that, and that it's a fair and consistent basis um, globally, then we might lose the public again in terms of the, the opportunities for these reductions and demonstrating that we've achieved them. I'll just add that to that. 
I, I, I think, Jewel, I think that's spot on. And I would extend it. It's not only um, with respect to public acceptance, it's also having these benchmarks and, and accounting, as you, as you say, um, in market mechanisms as well, so that you, we can allow people to compete on an even level playing field. Thank you. So I think this uh, is a good segue for Alexander Sue's question. Um, Alexander, do you want to unmute yourself and ask Jules directly your question? Yeah, sure. I, I don't know if this is too naive a question, but I was just curious, I guess, about that last slide you showed, um, where you know there's so much uh, crossing between different countries. So I was curious, I guess, in addition to market demands, are there sort of considerations of you know, different policies or different incentives, um, you know, from different uh, market countries or like of the final products uh, that are kind of taken into account at the refinement level right now. Yeah, I would say definitely there's not enough uh, dialogue across those supply chains, right? There's um, intermediaries that mean that some, some points in the supply chain never actually even know what is the fate of, of some of the products that are being produced. And I think that leads to missing out on opportunities for that. There will definitely be um, conflicts and, and different interests and, you know, even the public perception will be different in different regions. So I think we can't expect that we're going to get a uniform decision everyone agrees to and then everyone does it. I think that that's uh, unrealistic. But I think taking those you know strategic views across the, this very complex network of, of players um, really can help give us the sense for which direction should we be going. And again, going into this you know measuring and, and, and managing these emissions, um, as, as long as that is, is credible, transparent, and consistent, um, then we can start seeing that movement. But I think you know it will continue to be you know, uh, different transitions in different regions, for sure. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. I want to spend at least a couple of minutes before we get into the break and conclusions from this panel, talking about intermittency, because I think, Jennifer, you highlighted really, uh, really well in your presentation how in, uh, when we think about electrifying processes, we have to consider the fact that uh, if we want to operate on renewable electricity, the sources will be intermittent. And uh, then Raphael showed us the importance of storage. So where do you think are the, well, we probably know the challenges, but where do you think are the opportunities there in um, uh, then modifying current processes or coming up with, should we really consider coming up with completely different processes that are able to withstand intermittency more reliably than the processes that we're running today. Because as you said, even processes that have minimal input from electricity, then uh, engineers uh, are really worried about uh, intermittency in those cases. What, what, what do you think, Jennifer, is an opportunity here? Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to steal from Jewel again and say it's that systems approach. It has to be um, drawing a box around the whole system. We can solve little individual pieces of the problem, um, but these, these grids, generation, um, trans, um, transmission, and then usage are really on a systems basis. And we've, we've if you look at um, crude oil and chemicals, global supply chains, things like um, fuel pipeline systems, feedstock pipeline systems, we're, we're able to solve those problems from a material balance point of view. Um, having multiple feedstock pipelines into a plant or multiple fuel pipelines into a plant just to deal with that, hey, what if I lose pipeline number one, I got pipeline number two ready to go. And we need that, that similar um, thinking applied to the electrical system. And, there, and I think there are ways um, to design that, whether they're capitally efficient or not is, remains to be seen. But having some real dedication to that um, reliability and intermittency issue is, is going to be required. And I would conclude then, in terms of uh, relationships between academia and uh, industry, this is a topic that we will be discussing very much in detail tomorrow, but again, I wanna take a minute or two to discuss about that. Where do you think are the opportunities in um, uh, developing these relationships with the academia and industry to come up with uh, different ways to 
uh, potentially novel ways and processes to uh, produce the chemicals that we need today. And what is it that, what would be your suggestions for academics in then using the guidance from um, industry essentially in making sure that we focus on the right thing? I think it starts with conversations like we've had over the past couple of days. I think um, just, you know, I'm just so uh, thankful that Stanford wanted to invite some industry experts to come speak at this conference so you can hear what our concerns are and hear, you know, if you're going to focus, focus here. And, and, and what I'd say is um, CCS hydrogen, that's in the mix. We're, this, this is something that is going to be in the mix. It's something we specifically at ExxonMobil are serious about developed a whole new uh, business line, low carbon solutions to address it. Um, and then um, looking, providing that um, technical and transparent, consistent look into some of the issues that we've discussed is important. And then thinking broadly to the geographic and geopolitical ramifications of this. I mean, that that's that's been historic in the oil, gas, petrochemical industry since its inception. And I think, um, you know, academic institutions that have the, the, the great minds and the time to, to research those things are going to be critical moving forward. So just, I would say, recognizing the complexity and ensuring that we're working on the right problems. Thank you, Jennifer. Jill, yeah, please. Yeah, I was just going to add, I think, you know, doing the systems level analysis couldn't happen without collaboration with industry. I think if we just went to the academic literature, there would be insufficient data uh, and expertise in those boots on the ground of, of the intricacies of how these things operate, how decisions are made and things like that. So I think that's absolutely critical. I was also just going to highlight an example in the carbon conversion space, well, capture and conversion. Um, Lafarge Wholesome, a big cement company um, in their, their BC plant that they have, um, they're actually doing a capture uh, demonstration and conversion technologies. And so right on their site, they're actually demonstrating some of these earlier stage technologies at a smaller pilot type scale, but doing it at the operational site, um, you know, careful to, to not affect operations, but really using it as an opportunity to mentor uh, technology developers and test out the technologies and help them scale the technologies. It seems like that, you know, some of the technologies that they're, they're deploying are actually academic uh, lab scale work that they're trying to move forward. And so those kind of synergies I also see as, as real opportunities. Thank you, Jill. Rafael, do you have some final remarks on this before we go to a break? Yes, effectively, uh, I agree. Um, uh, it's very important, yes, to, to develop this disruptive uh, uh, technology toward uh, uh, synthetic fuels. But one point which is very important to have uh, between uh, industry and academia is also technology supplier in order to, to go quickly to, uh, to uh, the upscaling of, of the technology. So I think I would say uh, when, when we have a good idea, it's very important to think uh, with the possibility to integrate quite quickly in our process uh, technology supplier in order to, to go quickly toward the solution. Thank you so much. And I have to thank uh, our industry uh, collaborators. Uh, I benefited as a young faculty member, I benefited tremendously from this uh, conversations throughout the years. And it's uh, also thanks to the, the willingness of um, you to come and join these uh, discussions, conversations uh, that we are able to, to move forward. So with that, I thank again, uh, Rafael Legal, Jules Bergerson and Jennifer Port for the outstanding presentations, uh, introduction to the challenges and the problems and also for being willing to then uh, interact with us uh, on this panel discussion. Uh, I think um, at least from my perspective, I have more questions than answers, but that's uh, what this uh, discussion should be all about. And uh, I look forward to working with uh, many uh, of us in the community in order to address some of the challenges that were presented in this panel. With that, thank you so much again, and I will pass the baton back to uh, Richard. Okay, <clears throat> thank you, Matteo. And thank you, uh, Jennifer, Jewel, Raphael, uh, a great panel, great discussion, um, and uh, we, uh, we'll continue, I'm sure, uh, the, con the, the conversations that we've had.